Yeah? Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Um, as follow-up to the several presentations that have been uh, given about planning so far to you this morning and then this great presentation about the trees, um, I am here to offer a landscape architect's perspective. Um, as um, Jason said, my practice is based in New England, and I work on landscapes of all different types, including um, streetscapes and waterfronts, uh, estate settings, uh, settings for municipal buildings, uh, public parks, and then, of course, cemeteries and burying grounds. And I think one of the reasons why uh, I've done quite a bit of work in cemeteries and burying grounds is because um, in New England, many of the cities and towns, uh, some of the only historic landscapes they have are cemeteries and burying grounds. And so that's how I come to them. Um, a couple of things I wanted to just respond to this morning. I, I think that there's actually quite a lot of interest in um, getting involved and also financing historic cemetery and burying ground restoration. I've seen that uh, all over uh, the New England states as well as in New York. And I think one of the reasons, well, there are two reasons for this. I thought about this at lunchtime. One is that um, the baby boomers are retiring. And a lot of them are becoming very interested in their, their past. They are interested in trying to preserve their communities they may, they may have lived in for decades or uh, their, their families may have lived in for generations. And they want to try to bring some uh, dignity to the burying grounds that are in those. And the second reason, uh, I think, is that, I mean, this is especially true in New England. I can't speak about the other parts of the country is that a lot of communities have seen cemeteries and burying grounds as uh, very vital to their heritage tourism efforts. Heritage tourism is a very big industry in New England, and people come from all over the world to see some of the oldest burying grounds in the country that we have, uh, mostly along the coast, uh, that have some of the oldest American artwork in them that is in, in existence. And you'll see some examples of that in my talk. So I actually have a very positive outlook about the efforts that are being made, and I think that are there can continue to be made, and I think we're all in a great place with that. Most of the projects I'm going to show you today are preservation plans that I have done, uh, but also ones that have begun to be implemented. So I would say that most of the work I do, do does not sit on the shelf, that it actually gets um, chipped away at little by little. And before I go I just want to acknowledge two of my three of my very close colleagues who are here today and also are going to be speaking this afternoon, without whom I would be um, not the successful landscape architect I am today. Jim and Mixie Fannin, who are sitting in the front row from Fannin Later, Fannin Later Preservation Consultants, and Irving Slavid, who's in the back row <laughs> from Monument Conservation Collaborative. We have worked together for many, many years, and I'm going to be referring to them as I go through this. So. Just acknowledge them as well. Okay. We're getting some feedback, aren't we? Are we getting? Okay. I do have a phone in my pocket. Does that help? Okay. Okay. So again, from a landscape architect's perspective perspective, why is it important to plan? I think that we have um, heard a lot about that today, and I want to talk about it again from a designer's point of view. The first reason is that all historic cemetery landscapes are not the same. Um, and as you know, you know we've moved through many uh, uh, centuries of history in this country. Our earliest burying grounds, um, the colonial burying grounds, uh, were very distinctive in the sense that they were irregular in layout. Often um, they are located on some of the only unaltered topography in the towns in New England. Uh, the graves were typically single, uh, laid out in rows. Oftentimes uh, individuals were interred next to people who were not related to them because they were interred as they died. And they typically contain native stones and once contained native trees. So in this image here, this is uh, uh, the oldest cemetery in Wilbraham, Massachusetts, which is in the Connecticut Valley. The stone uh, is made of red sandstone quarried across the state line in Connecticut, carved by a local artisan. 
And in the background, you can see some of the remaining old sugar maple trees, which have been thriving on this landscape um, for many, many, many years until 2001 when a tornado swept through and took most of them down. Very distinctive character of the colonial burial grounds. Um, all things all changed in the Victorian era. I think that Matthew really alluded to that in his presentation very well. These were cemeteries were our first public parks, as many of you know. And they took on a very much um, uh, ornamental feel. Uh, many of them were elaborately designed. And I think this image uh, probably is an exaggeration, but it's a real photo. This is uh, the Valley Cemetery in Manchester, New Hampshire, which was established in 1840 by the Amerscape Mill Company that built the city. It's in the middle of the city and uh, has water running through the middle of it in a stream in a valley. And in the valley, uh, the city or the, the uh, company built this elaborate park, which was used as the first public park in Manchester, complete with um, summer houses and the stream bed lined, bridges, beautiful trees, all ornamental shrubbery, full-time gardening staff who left their equipment on site. The burials were up on the hillsides above on either side. So this is actually the base of a, a large family columbarium. So again, it really took on more of the look of a, a public park. So you can see this is quite different from the colonial burial grounds. And then of course, modern burials, you move more into the 20th century, um, the landscape became much more homogenized. The markers, similar materials, similar size, similar shape. Oftentimes these are laid out uh, on grids and many flush markers were new used and fewer trees were often planted because of ease of mowing. The mechanization made uh, mowing a lot easier and maintenance crews wanted fewer obstructions. So what's important about all of this is it's important to know uh, where a cemetery fits into this continuum. And oftentimes cemeteries will contain more than one style. And as a landscape architect, it's important for us to protect each of those styles so as not to change cemeteries that all look the same. The second is that people have talked about this a lot, the needs are large and complex and overwhelming. So uh, this is a cemetery that Irving Clavett and I worked on in Stoner, Massachusetts, um, in the middle of the, the town. And you can see the complex problems here. Does anybody want to identify for me what they, what they are? The tree, okay, growing out of the stone. Anything else? Previously repaired, and this is a copper cap that was added, we think, in the 50s or 40s to try to slow the infiltration of water. It was done on many, many of the stones in the cemetery. Uh, the also thing I would point to, again, as a landscape architect, whoops, is the chain link fencing. And also the context, which is really quite changed. You know, before it was, when it was first settled as a little burying ground, it was kind of in the middle of the town with a lot of, lot of development around it. And now it's really been encroached upon by um, urban development. Other problems are uh, often these are not mapped. I'm gonna talk to you about that in a little while. And just structures failing and roads failing. Here's some other problems. Um, in addition to the gravestones and monuments being damaged, um, oftentimes our burying grounds get lost. This is in Norwell, again, the oldest burying ground in Norwell, Massachusetts. If you drive by it, you would not even know it's there. It is overgrown, but it's also unsigned. Its perimeter wall is falling down, and worst of all, in my opinion, it's full of snakes. So the third reason is that for funding for this does come, come in small increments. I will say I do think it's there, but it's often in small increments. And so in planning, it's very important to design your implementation steps around that reality and uh, define what you're gonna do uh, little by little. Funding can come from a lot of different sources, um, grants, private donations, and then of course don't forget volunteer labor this is a locksmith who volunteered his time to come and unlock a tomb that needed to be um, explored as part of a planning project that we did. So now I'm gonna take you to the very end of Cape Cod. 
and we'll talk to you about uh, some of the, what I see are the most important components in coming up with a really conservation plan for the landscape. And in my experience, have led to uh, great success in the plans actually being implemented. And this is a good example because the U.S. Cemetery has really, really been um, preserved very well. This is the Winter Street Cemetery. It's in Provincetown, which is at the end of Cape Cod. Provincetown uh, was the original site of the Pilgrim's Landing in 1622. They came there before they settled Plymouth, Har Pl Plymouth and stayed in Provincetown for a short time um, at the end of December, beginning of November of that year, and then left. The cemetery was established when the town of Provincetown actually emerged as a municipality uh, in the 1700s. And it is located on a dean. So in the bottom image, you can see um, this is a forested dune set back from the water, which sounds like a great idea because it's up high, but the problem is it's forested, so it's got encroachment on it all the time. When I first went to work with the Cemetery Commission in Provincetown, the first thing I did was sit down with them and develop a program, and what I mean by that is not um, a program of events for the evening. What I wanted to do with the cemetery? What did they want to do? Did they, um, at the time when I came there originally, they, it was surrounded by a six feet high chain link fence, completely enclosed and locked and completely overgrown. Could not get into it. You didn't even know it was there. Uh, so they, you know, pretty easily came up with the notion that, well, geez, we really need to make this more accessible to the public. So that's going to be our main objective here. And that's the first thing we want to do. And you can see the results of that um, in these two images. This top image is a new entrance that we created. It's a little pocket park, um, but it also commemorates the location of the first meeting house in Provincetown. When I came to work here, this was a gravel parking area. And the bottom image is a second entrance that was created off of the main street, again, just leading into the cemetery. So the program involves access. It involves creating um, uh, a clearer sense of um, circulation through the cemetery, uh, a better perimeter, and also, obviously, a conservation of the stones. So the second piece of this, and I think that Matthew talked about this again well, that is very important, and this is also, also can be something that be quite time-consuming and also frustrating, is coming up with an understanding of the history and how the cemetery changed over time. And again, this is a, the importance of this is it helps you understand what you want to preserve, what needs to be preserved, what needs to be removed, if so. I say this can be frustrating because oftentimes documentation is found in a lot of different sources. So in, at the Winter Street Cemetery, we were looking at old maps. Um, this sh is an old map from the 1800s that shows that the cemetery was quite isolated with a pretty um, open context. And then also old postcards which here shows how open the terrain was in the cemetery. Um, I've also been involved in you know, roaming through archives of libraries late in the afternoon. The sun's going down. I did this with Jim Fannin in Adams, Massachusetts, looking for old maps of the cemetery and finding them rolled, the original cemetery blueprints rolled up in a garbage bag. So the sources of information for documentation come from a lot of different places. can be time consuming, but also quite important. An accurate map. Now here's a really another big challenge. Sometimes cemeteries are quite well documented, but I think uh, my colleagues and I would say that in New England, the early burying grounds typically were not mapped. And so one of the challenges in doing a plan, and this is important not only for conserving landscape features, but also in doing any kind of stone conservation assessment, is to have an accurate map. Um, you can imagine what it's like to create a map on top of for a forest dune. And Irving and I worked on this project, and here's Irving's um, flagging tape. He used this to make a 40-foot grid over the entire cemetery that I then transposed onto this map down here, and he located all the individual stones within it. So together working on it, we were able to put it together that way. But um, it's not always done this way, but this is one approach. I wouldn't recommend it unless you have to, but we had to. But again, the accurate map is really important. 
Fourthly, again, thorough assessment, and this has been spoken about a lot today, all the different pieces that go into a cemetery um, need to be looked at, uh, inventoried, and also determine uh, their condition. So not only the stones, but also any kind of structural feature, the major trees, um, circulation system. And this uh, image here, which is one of my assessment drawings, it shows uh, the different views that are possible from within and looking out of the cemetery. Those are also very important to consider because it's a place that's frequented by a lot of visitors. And the town wanted it to be visible. And then um, recommendations, as I mentioned, that, that are phased. And again, I can't stress this enough, that it's important to create recommendations that can be implemented in a realistic way. So in my experience, it's not uh, 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 cemeteries are usually not preserved all in one fell swoop. And if we go through the tree project, you saw that was the case. Usually, you know, there are $10,000, $15,000, maybe even less increments of money that come along. So the recommendations need to really be modeled. Um, these are some drawings that I did of one set of recommendations for the cemetery that helped them with clearing. So it was very overgrown, and we began by clearing some of the larger trees and then taking out some of the um, understory, which is a lot of bull briars, and then eventually ending up with clear pathways where gravestones were exposed. But again, the recommendations need to be um, in manageable time. And then finally, uh, again, cannot stress this enough, the maintenance program is really critical. And this is something people almost always forget about. Like you, you do the preservation, it's all done, but then you realize that, oh my goodness, you know, we have to take care of this place over time. And in Provincetown on the 4th of June, which you can see down here, uh, when I first came to the site, this is what it looked like. You couldn't even get through it. It was like bushwhacking our way through a jungle. Um, and then little by little, the vegetation removed, it started to get opened up. The town has been really creative about keeping this place open. They try to get AmeriCorps volunteers to come in every year, crews, and do clearing, and, and then the DPW also does clearing as well. So who does this planning? And again, people have talked about this a lot. Uh, one of the things that I think is really critical is to have a really strong steward, whether that's the cemetery commission, uh, a friends group, or sometimes it's a person who really takes ownership of this and kind of keeps the bus rolling. That is really critical. Um, I also am, I advocate for landscape architects because we have a holistic view of the landscape and we look at landscapes as, as works of art. Conservators, uh, I don't think I need to advocate for them, although I will say that um, in our region, because there is quite a little, lot of money available in the municipal level for stone conservation, there are a lot of people who are saying they're conservators working who really are not trained to do so. And so they come in and work on gravestones, and instead of um, conserving them, they actually ruin them. So you need to be very careful um, of who gets chosen to do that kind of work. And I think Francis Miller is going to talk a little bit about that later as well. And then other professionals. Now, this individual who's uh, squatting inside of this private receiving team um, actually happens to be the international expert, expert on accelerated bridge reconstruction. Uh, but he's also um, one of the greatest historic structures analysts that I know. He's a structural engineer. And he's worked with um, me and also with the Fannins for many, many years looking at historic structures and going inside and evaluating the condition. In this case, it was a tomb. Um, he has a real passion for this, as well as the expertise. So where to start? Um, again, as I mentioned, the steward is very important. So if there is not an entity available or established, that's something that should be considered. Um, the plan will help you identify needs. And then seeking funding. And again, there are a lot of different sources that are possible, and those should be explored. And then finally, hiring a team of professionals. And then finally, it's really important to get a lot of people involved. The more people you have involved, um, the more ownership there will be of it and the greater care in the long term.
So these are my communities that I have listed here. And then again, I want to thank the Fannins and um, Urban Slavich and MTC. And I'll be happy to answer questions.